Right, well, hello folks, and welcome to episode 182 of Retro Power and Cut. And we're going to start in the paint booth, unusually, uh, this time, because in front of us here is the Allegro, or the first of the two Allegro shells, uh, that we have just got into Epoxy Primer, which was pretty much, uh, went, went reasonably well according to plan. It's a very short week this week. Uh, Jamie's off, Jamie behind camera is off on Friday. Uh, and he needs to get the video edited, so we're actually recording on Wednesday afternoon stroke evening. Uh, and Monday was bank holiday, so we've only actually worked yesterday and today. And yesterday was finishing off the final uh, bits of metalwork and getting this stripped down. So Matt and Tom and Bobby have all been working on uh, this car, mob-handed, uh, yesterday and, this, and a little bit of this morning. Uh, particularly yesterday, getting this um, strip down work done uh, and getting the final bits of the um, sills done. So Tom was working on uh, the back end of the sills, getting them cut off, getting the capping pieces made for those uh, and getting those welded up and doing some general tidying in that area. Uh, and Matt and Bobby were doing various uh, bits of finishing off, welding up uh, little remaining holes, sorting out pinholes, uh, welding a few remaining bosses on, uh, generally just various bits of finishing off. Uh, and then also getting the front of the car, well, sorry, getting all of the cars stripped down, just getting all of the remaining running gear removed, or the suspension removed, and every last nut, bolt, and washer removed and bagged up and either on the shelf or over by the uh, chassis jig, ready to bolt onto the other Allegro shell when we put that one on the chassis jig. Uh, so they've been getting that lot done, and then uh, we were in a position this morning to get this into the, well, uh, yesterday actually, end, end of play yesterday, we got the uh, body shell into our blast room, uh, and Bobby got the um, rotisserie ends put on, and we got it onto the rotisserie in there, flipped it upside down, so Matt could just finish off blending the wire edge in to the rear valance uh, with some lead on the back. Uh, and then this morning, fired up the big compressor, uh, got uh, the whole body shell blasted, the underside all to what we call a white metal state where there's none, if you look at the uh, metal before you start blasting it, there's none of the original, no matter how close you look, there's none of the original surface visible um, to the naked eye looking closely, there's none of the original surface visible anywhere. That's kind of a white metal standard to the underneath. It needs to be pretty much that to be able to zinc metal spray it. Uh, and then the rest of the car blasted, excluding the roof, uh, excluding the A surface areas uh, on this. That's the roof, the C pillars, the rear scuttle and the front scuttle um, and the valances. Excluding those areas, all of the rest of it blasted to semi-white metal, pretty much white metal standard, just maybe not perfect um, over all of the rest of it in preparation for the epoxy primer. Uh, and then once all that blasting was done, quick, quick clean down, uh, quick blow out of the shell, and then zinc metal spraying. So we've got the, uh, the zinc metal spray done on the complete underside of the car, got all that complete. Uh, that all went fine, very sweaty job, very hot job, not the most pleasant job in the world, but it's all applied. We've done the zinc metal spray to the full underside, all of the window apertures, all of the, uh, the door apertures, the complete sills, and then all of the areas that are going to be covered by the uh, carbon fibre panels uh, have all been um, completely zinc metal sprayed. The boot aperture and then the vast bulk of the engine bay as well, plus the inner wings, all, all, all of the non-A surface areas and non-interior areas have all been zinc metal sprayed now in preparation for uh, the, their, what, what will later on be their Raptor coating, but at the moment is the epoxy primer uh, coating. And that's then all done in readiness for the carbon fiber panels to be bolted on. So tomorrow, this will be taken back out into the workshop and the, all of the areas where the carbon will be bonded on will be abraded back it will be taken back to bare metal and then we'll be bonding the um, carbon, carbon fibre panels into place. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's the plan for tomorrow. Get this back out of here, back onto the chassis jig, belt sand all of the bond lines back uh, to bare metal and then, yeah, then we'll be able to uh, get the carbon panels on. So yeah, once they, uh, they, that's all the zinc metal spray in place, uh, then onto the epoxy primer, uh, Mark took over, got the, all the grit out of the car, got it all cleaned up, got it all vacuumed out. DA sanded the roof and the C pillars and the rear scuttle and the front scuttle and both valances. 
Uh, so they were all completely clean, make sure there's no zinc overspray on them, make sure there's no dirt on them and no residual corrosion on them. Uh, so they're completely clean back to bare metal because some of this primer may not, some of it may be taken back off at some point during prep, but there's a good chance a lot of it will stay uh, in place for the rest of the prep work. Um, so that's got uh, that all um, prepared and ready, and then Mark's brought it into the booth uh, and got the um, Celemix uh, 2K, well, it's a two component epoxy high build anti corrosive very high zinc content primer. He's got that applied to the whole of the body shell other than the underside, which is obviously zinc metal sprayed. He's applied that to the whole of the top side of the body shell, I say, in preparation for us to then tomorrow be able to start fitting the uh, carbon fiber panels. So that's pretty much where we're at with that. Moving on from that, we'll go over to the interceptor. So Stu has been working on the rear end of the interceptor and primarily getting these radius arms in place. So a little bit of background to this. You may recall uh, when we were initially working on this car, there was a bit of a strange long radius arm arrangement tied into this floor cross member, which we weren't very happy with. It didn't have enough compliance. Um, and despite the added length of the arm was still going to cause binding issues through the travel of the suspension because it had an almost non-compliant bushing on one end and a, um, either a clevis or a rose joint on the other end. But certainly not enough compliance to allow for the change in length even on a longer arm. Now, interestingly, this height's rear end I believe, I'll stand, be stand corrected, but somebody has mentioned this in the comments previously, and it's certainly my belief that that Heights rear end was designed as a, as a substitute for a Jaguar type rear end, Jaguar IRS, and to that end we've discovered that um, sure enough the lower arms actually measure, I, I speculated they'd probably be about that length, Stu checked, and the, uh, the lower wishbones are nominally the same length as series uh, Jaguar XJ, lower wishbones. So uh, conveniently uh, the angles that they would be travelling through would be exactly the same as uh, the angles that Jaguar arms would be travelling through and so it entirely made sense to use Jaguar trailing arms uh, in this application uh, and conveniently their, their mounting positions on the body shell tie in really nicely to the points on the body shell where we would want to feed the loads in which is where the rear chassis blades meet uh, the main chassis cross member at the back. Um, so that's all come together really quite nicely. So Stu's fabricated these um, rear mountings, got those all finished. He's fabricated some new brackets to bracket those radius arms to the wishbones. Uh, we had to just extend those mounts slightly and, uh, and widen them slightly from uh, the heights uh, mounts that were on there. So a couple of modifications there. But with those tweaks, um, he's got it uh, to the stage where the, the, these Jaguar radius arms fit really nicely. Uh, everything works perfectly. The compliance in the bushes is exactly right for the uh, rear end setup, and everything should work really nicely. It's all—it's basically just come together uh, as well as one would have expected, unusually well <laughs> for this sort of thing. So yeah, we're just going to use Jaguar components. They make loads of sense in this application. And then uh, this morning, Stu's just been working out the mountings for the um, the uh, sort of safety straps on the radius arms. I guess these are a, a safety strap in case of bush failure. They retain the arm. Um, these are the standard Jaguar Series uh, Series 3 uh, XJ parts, these straps, so we're just using a pair of those. Uh, he's just putting the mountings into the floor uh, for, the, for the fixings for those um, to allow the, uh, to the, for those to, to be allowed to bolt up. And at that point, it's basically just the final welding needed on the, uh, on the diff nose mount and some various other bits of final welding and tidying up needed, which will, will all be done when this is removed from the car. And the other bit, which I'd forgotten about, the rear coilover mounts, the upper rear coilover mounts, as designed on this setup, I'm not very happy with. The um, upper mountings are half inch bolts. Uh, as far as I can see, they're either half or five eighths. No, they are half inch bolts. Uh, and they're in single shear with quite a large overhang on quite a small spacer. Uh, and I don't like that setup at all. There's, there's not many places on a, on a vehicle that we design, certainly, but on most aftermarket vehicles, fasteners are the point the last point you're going to get a failure because they're normally vastly over specified particularly on American vehicles that most of the fasteners are grossly over specified for the jobs they've got to do but that's a, stand, a really big standout uh, failing in that is that that upper mounting for that damper I strongly suspect would be stressing uh, a half inch 
um, you know, bolt, say an 8.8 .8 high tensile bolt there, uh, which would be whatever, I mean, between 8 and 900 newtons a square mil. I haven't done the calculations, I don't know the exact weight of the car, but I have a strong suspicion that it would be stressing that bolt not a million miles away from its limits, uh, which is a very unusual situation on, uh, on, on, a, on a car, and certainly not one that I want to put in on this. So we're going to actually fabricate a double shear mounting for the upper end of that coilover, because it won't be particularly hard to do in this application, um, and we've got plenty of room around that area to do that. So we're going to fabricate a double shear mount. So that's really the next stage on on the underside of uh, this is to get that done. Stu's making really good progress. It's come together absolutely beautifully. It's a really good solution. Really happy with it, how it's all worked out. Great, great plant there. All gone very well. So that's that. Walk past this. We were going to mention this last week and we had a bit of a, we had a, bit of a camera equipment breakdown and that we keep having a bit of a problem with the microphone with our new DJI um, camera and the Rode microphone keep, there seems to be some incompatibility going on so I'm hoping that the sound's working now. Um, ignore the bits of wood lying in it. We've got a new uh, water trough or water table for our plasma cutter. I think I've mentioned it before. I tried to extend the size on the old trough because the, the old trough had been made using a, a standard sheet of steel. I've forgotten the size whatever the next sheet up from a from a 2550 by 1250 sheet is um the, the next one up i think it's a three meter by 1.8 meter or something it had been made from that and the problem with that is <coughs> it wasn't long enough to give a size the size were only 50 mil deep it means you tend to get water spraying out the sides of the tr uh, table and you can't run the plate that you're cutting immersed in the water. I tried to extend the table but the shrinkage of the welds caused it to distort the sides and then basically I, you know, I hot pulled it back but it's left the base wavy, it wasn't really ideal. Um, so I finally got around to getting uh, Tamworth steel and Lysit fabrications to sort me out making a new water trough would be dead easy apart from the fact it needs to be made in one piece because you can't put welds in the corners if you put welds in the corners it will distort it and it needs to be basically dead flat which this is um, so it needs to be made in one piece and to make it in one piece it needs to be made from a four meter by two meter sheet of steel which is not a particularly widely stocked sheet size and it also needs a three meter press bait break to be long enough to bend it it's not actually three meters long but it's beyond 2.5 meters long i can't remember the exact length but it's longer than we'll go in a 2.5 meter press break so you need a three meter press break and a four meter by two meter sheet of three mil steel to make it so it wasn't especially cheap to make and obviously there's a little bit of a wait in getting hold of the steel but they've done it they've made a nice job uh, we're going to get that put on the machine in the next few days although with callaway i'm struggling for time to get maintenance jobs done we're going to get that on the machine then we could once it's sat on flat on the deck in the machine then i can put the combs these pieces which hold the wavy slats they can be laid into the bottom tacked it tack welded in place uh, and then i can tack the brackets onto the sides of it and it can all be bolted in and then we'll have a nice new water trough uh, that's all flat and will help us a lot in terms of height control on the plasma so that's all good there quattro Nothing has been going on in the workshop on the Quattro this week. There are things going on in the background on that, uh, twofold. One is upstairs in the CAD den, so we'll go and have a look up there in a minute. Uh, and the other is me trying to get hold of parts. Um, I haven't had any contact from the guy who put a comment on YouTube saying he had the chassis wells. So if that was you, I've forgotten the username. However, it would be really welcome if you would let me know whether you do have the piece I was actually after, which is the entire inner wing and chassis rail for the near side. The forward section of the chassis rail that goes to the bulkhead plus the inner wing. If you do have that complete Audi piece, um, I will buy it. So that, that's fine. Um, but I also have a very helpful chap called Phil, I've forgotten his surname, um, who is also looking for parts. He's managed to locate me a new old stock right-hand drive scuttle panel uh, in Germany. So we're just waiting to get an idea on the shipping cost or the movement cost on that um, so that we can send somebody some money to be able to get hold of that. So that, that's what's going on there is sourcing of parts and design work is going on there. Moving on from that, we'll get to other Allegro. So Matt's doing a bit of work on the floor here on this because we don't want to put this one onto the jig yet because the one we've already been looking at is going back on the jig to put the panels on. 
So Matt's just getting on with a couple of jobs he can do with this on the floor at the moment, and Bobby likewise, again, doing, doing some of the jobs that can be done with it just sat on a trolley on the floor while we wait to be able to put the other one back on the jig to put the carbon panels on. But yeah, this will be then, as soon as we get those carbon quarters, which are just nestling up there on top of the E-type at the moment, as soon as we get this sat on the jig, then those panels will be going on. That one will be getting buttoned up completely, moved out of the way, and then this car will go onto the chassis jig to have all the final stuff done and all the carbon panel fit up done on this one. And then this will follow the same path that we've just seen uh, with, the, with the first of the two cars. So yeah, convoluted, lots of cars moving around, but basically getting both of these cars through that chassis jig, because once they're both through that chassis jig, that will be stripped down, that jig will be moved out, and the XJ Coupe, which is not in the workshop here at the moment, will be going in that space and work can start on that. And that's where we're at with all the uh, fabrication side of things. <coughs> and then, in the background, the Redux body shell is at the final stages of the flatting and polishing operation. I think the guys have been struggling a little bit with some, uh, possibly some scratches on one quarter panel. We've had trying to keep an absolutely dust-free atmosphere in there is quite challenging. I think they've had a couple of issues with bits of dust getting in there, which is why I'm sealed out of there at the moment. We're trying to keep, uh, trying to keep it so that no dust is getting drawn into there. Um, but they're pretty much getting there with it, I think, now. We've, we're on the final steps. And then, also in the background, uh, in the body shop, Mark has been doing the prep on the panels for the Churchill project because the next car through the paint booth, I think, as I mentioned last week, will be the Churchill project. So I know Matt, uh, Mark has been doing the panel prep for those, so that the because I think he's going to paint the panels first on Churchill. So he's been getting the prep done on those, ready for those to go through the booth, uh, which hopefully should be happening next week. I think all being well. So I think at that point we're going to move on. I'm going to hand over to myself in the assembly shop and we'll go through a few things in there. Yeah. Thank you, Nat, and here we are with Nat. <laughs> um, no, as if by magic, uh, here we are teleported uh, into the assembly shop, and we're going to start with the primary focus at the moment because pretty much everybody uh, has been working on the uh, Project One Mark One Escort. Uh, we have a bit of a deadline we're, we're trying to hit with this, and as usual, when there's a deadline, things start to fight back a little bit. So we're having a few challenges one, one way or another. Not, not unexpected, because there always is at this stage in projects, but uh, one or two things are fighting us a little bit. Alex has been working primarily on uh, engine calibration, which is still at its early stages, because there have been a few little hiccups along the way. One of them is using the uh, fundamentally you, uh, various issues with using the Motec ECU to drive the Gemfi throttle motor. There are, because this uh, is drive by wire throttle, and there are a few glitches and bumps along the road. And without going into loads of detail, there are a few glitches and bumps along the road with operating that throttle motor, which is fighting. Uh, he's making progress with it. Uh, is at the stage now of PID tuning that, and uh, there's a few glitches along the way with that as well. However, it is operating now, so that's a step forward. Uh, the throttle motor is doing as it's told now, and it is opening and closing the throttle correctly, and it is doing that in a, a reasonably controlled manner. So that's all. Uh, that's all a good uh, state of affairs there. <coughs> Further complications are we have a very minor fuel leak from a connection on the fuel rail which is irritating because it is, it appears to be a fault with one of the actual unions, uh, either a very tiny dink in the seat or that the seat is in, incorrectly machined. We're just trying to determine that at the moment, hence this link pipe, to try and determine which side of the union it's coming from. 
very minor leak, but a leak nonetheless, which we can't really have. And uh, another minor glitch on the way has been um, the alternator. We were struggling with charging. Uh, and this was one of those stupid things that we'd all overlooked, which was that the alternator is bushed and you all know what I'm going to say next. The alternator's on flexible bushes and therefore uh, doesn't have an earth path to the engine block. And we'd all overlooked the fact that it doesn't have an earth path to the engine block. And that was the reason it wasn't charging. So it's a very simple reason and a little bit stupid. I will put my hand in the air and uh, admit. However, sometimes we, we do silly things and sometimes we overlook things. Uh, and that was one of those things. So <clears throat> that's now rectified. Well, that's sorted and then there's just lots and lots of uh, paths forward being done uh, i know that uh, gibbo has been working on final assembly of various trim items in the car getting the boot area all assembled i know adam has been working on the uh, other adam as an adam mans has been working on the boot lock getting that assembled getting that working i know that james has been working on getting the bonnet furnishings fitted and operational which they're fitted operational is another step we've got some adjustments and uh, tweaks to do there because we've got a little issue with adjustment on that uh, which we need to resolve uh, and then another major uh, path forward has been sort of kind of based on the CAD side of things in that um, George has been finalizing the design for the steering column shroud uh, Luke had already done earlier on done a steering column shroud design however uh, the plugs and switch gear were modified subsequent to that piece of design being done such that that design wouldn't fit. So uh, George has, has altered that design and redone it um, so that the plugs on the steering column now fit within the shroud. Uh, <clears throat> he's printed a trial one in PLA, that worked fine. He's now printed the, the final version in um, the uh, I'm just trying to remember now, I'm going to be umming and erring on camera what the uh, material is. I think it's P-A-H-T-C-F is what it's referred to by Bamboo Labs, which is um, polyamide, i.e. nylon. Um, HT meaning high temperature, CF meaning carbon fibre. So it's uh, high temperature nylon with fine um, chopped strands of carbon fibre embedded in it. So it's a very tough and quite heat resistant plastic and it's good for final use parts that are actually being installed on a car. So we've printed the new complete steering column shroud which is in two halves in, uh, in that PAHTCF on the Bamboo Labs printer. Uh, but that was a 20... Oh, I can't even remember now. Something like a 27-hour print. It's quite a big print, that, because that's a fast printer as well. But it is a fairly slow printing um, film, uh, material, that. Uh, but yeah, that was a 27-hour print. That finished last thing last night. George is just doing a couple of little tweaks to the inside bits of that and getting all the um, sprues off it and generally tidying it up uh, as we speak. Uh, and then that'll be going uh, to be leather trimmed this afternoon. Uh, so we're uh, <laughs> we're up against it a little bit timeline wise uh, so yeah that's uh, that's progressing pretty well uh, and then I'm just looking at what else is going on lots of lots of bits of interior fettling getting pieces together there and I think we're going to be doing some wheel alignment on it a little bit later today get it make sure the wheels are in the right places and pointing in the right direction I don't think they're too far off but uh, they, they need uh, it needs the alignment doing uh, and then we need to get the uh, paint on the front end paintwork uh, flatted and polished uh, so that's all ready to go and then we're getting pretty close to it being good enough for its first appointment uh, it won't be finished at that first appointment there is quite a lot of other work to do most noticeably engine calibration the fact that it runs uh, and hopefully will drive not that it's driven yet but the fact that it runs and drives is a far cry from it being a finished car uh, as anybody <laughs> in this line of business will know um, but uh, the first stage was running driving and looking like looking like a complete car which we're, we're getting pretty close to now we're getting we're getting uh, somewhere near with all of that and that's pretty much where things stand with the project one escort further to that we have been making some progress on the Camaro, so we're going to have a look at that. And so, as if by magic, onto the Camaro. Uh, and Ant has been making progress on a few little fronts here. It's all very small detail work. Um, so it's quite time consuming. And it's, as is always the way with all the fine tuning, fine detail work, it, does, it progress, progress looks small, but does take time. 
One area he has been working on was fitting the rear screen trim clips. Uh, there's a couple of little bits of debris on those and paint build up on them and various things that may fitting them just need a little bit of detail work, little, a couple of little bits of filler left on a couple of them and li little things like that that needed tidying up uh, on the little um, pins that are spot welded into the window aperture to take the trim clips. So he's tidied those up, got all those trim clips fitted, done the touch ups wherever he's had to uh, attack any little bits of paint on those pins. But what I would say is um, very, very relevant at this point on this job is that the these spring clips are probably one of the reasons why the front and rear screens are rotted out on most Camaros of this era, is these clips. They, they are basically specifically designed to make the screen trims take all the paint off the aperture when you fit them. They, they, they clamp the, the trims between the, uh, the clip and the paintwork of the car, uh, where this, in, where this uh, masking tape is around the corner at the moment. But when you fit those trims, they basically just peel the paint straight off the car. And obviously on an original car, there was very little paint on there, and then it was bare metal under it. So they just rusted away around the apertures, which is why they're always rotten. One thing of note on the cars that we build here is that we always zinc metal spray around the window apertures so that if there is any paintwork damage when these trims are fitted there is a sacrificial anode layer covering the steel underneath so that if the paint is damaged rust won't carry on wildly around there you may get some very localized little bits of rusting but it's not going to rot the screen aperture out that, that zinc will sit in there and protect that area from any any damage that occurs through fitting the windows and for, through fitting the trims so we want a very early example of bonded in screens these cars the front and rear screens both bonded in and uh, hence the use of these clips to hold the trims in place but uh, yeah little aside that's one of the reasons we zinc metal spray around there is exactly this sort of thing, the, the paintwork damage that can be caused by fitting those. Further to that, Ant's been, he's obviously been fitting the front screen trims as well, same deal there, getting the uh, door pin switches fitted, getting the conduits in place for the door electrics. At the outset, uh, this car was not having any door electrics, and it is now having door electrics. So as a, a, a little bit of an addition there, meaning we needed to put the, uh, the access holes in for the conduits that feed, go into the doors to feed the electrics to the doors. So we've had to put some post paintwork, which we don't particularly like doing, put some holes into the A-posts and into the doors. So Ant's been doing that operation very carefully, and hence why the car's on a jaunty angle here, because he's had to have both the doors open He's also had, uh, he, he needed a bit of room to work basically. So he's uh, been getting the holes put in and the paint touch-ups done for putting the conduits into the, uh, between the A-posts and the doors. He's also been doing the washer tank wiring, which I think we'll have shown the washer tank wiring, the washer tank plumbing even. Uh, we've shown about the washers and the tank, etc. on previous episodes, I'm quite sure. Um, however, that was not all finally plumbed up and he's done a very, very neat job of getting the pipe work done which runs down the um, front subframe chassis rails, the front clip rail, the, uh, the feed pipe of the washer pump runs from the lower fabricated tank down in a little loop down the chassis rail to feed the remote pump which is also mounted on top of that rail uh, and then comes from there and up through and up to feed the, uh, the washer jets. So he's got that pipe work all routed uh, and then I think the next phase is we've got a little paint touch up to do on uh, the door uh, on the front edge of the door where we've caught the paintwork, unfortunately. Um, so we've got a little touch-up to do there. Uh, but yeah, we've, he's making good progress on getting all of the little detail work around the doors finalised, uh, which, as I say, does take time and is fiddly work. But we're getting there now and it's getting towards the stage of completion on that front. So I think that's pretty much where we're at on Camaro. And I think that wraps things up down here. So at that point, we'll probably have a little look at what's been going on in the CAD den. And I think to that end, I'm just going to hand that one over to George. Hello, viewers. So <laughs> today in the CAD cave, we have been working on, well, I've been working on um, Quattro. So I think it was end of last week or beginning, yeah, end of last week, Luke was um, scanning the um, bare metal of the shell. So effectively, he's had a little clean up of that. And now I've brought it into our kind of global file. Um, and, and I'm effectively aligning the, all the skeleton to the rest of what Luke scanned. Um, and then I'm just about to go into the process of exporting it into Fusion and then that's going to allow me to create all the mounting flanges 
and bits to make panels real things effectively. Um, so yeah, and then column shroud bits, which I think Nat's talked about, and a little bit on the scimitar, which I don't think we're going to be showing this week, but hopefully next week we'll have a bit more progress so we can actually show some where we're kind of where we're at with it. Um, I think that's it. Right, following on from George, uh, I've been working on a few smaller bits. Uh, we've got the Allegro front grille roughed out. We were originally doing a whole billet front grille, but after looking at the original, it's actually almost the exact same as what we were designing, and it's pretty cool as is. So instead, we're just going to do a billet center section with a slightly redesigned badge. Rest of it's kind of similar to what it was like before, but it will be a lot nicer finish, a lot nicer quality. Uh, other than that, I've been back on the intercept, intercept vents. Unfortunately, we tried to order two of these, which are Bentley uh, little mock-up vents, but we tried to order a mirror image left-hand one, but they sent another right-hand one, which was a bit annoying. But what we have got is the two that need to go 90 degree down. We've got those cadded with a connecting pipe, which takes it off towards the HVAC unit. Um, other than that, I've been back on with some Allegro bits and bobs as well in terms of the front vent blocks, as you can see here. Uh, these will be for engine air and will also house the indicator in this little slot here. Uh, vents out the back to the same diameter tube as what the intake will be. Um, and yeah, we're just working on those at the minute. We've got the 3D printed prototype on the printer as we speak. Um, and then, other than that, I've been on with roughing out the Quattro interior. It might seem a little bit eager, but I think one of the things that I've learned a lot since being here is the earlier you can start roughing stuff out, the earlier you have an idea of where everything needs to go, which is very important when the car's in metalwork, which it is at the minute. Um, you avoid stuff like missing mounting points, missing bosses for certain stuff, and it allows everything to go together a lot more smoother in the end. So we're on with roughing that out at the minute, putting certain components in where they need to be. We've got a small Motec screen in here, which we now know fits perfectly, will do the job perfectly. Um, still a lot of unknowns in terms of where the gear shift is going to be in the end, but at least we can get a rough idea for that and the sense console shape based off of that. The dash we can actually go ahead with quite a bit because it's using all the original support structure and based off of um, Harvey's render, which I have right here, I can start piecing together all of this top section here. Uh, so you can see here, this sort of vent style here, which we have mocked up in the CAD up here. And certain stuff like utilizing the original Quattro dash, which is gonna be my next job of scanning this and creating a backing for it. So it can actually hold a Motec screen in here as well. So we can start to get this sort of thing going on as well, and that sort of thing finalized. But yeah, other than that, just uh, cracking on with uh, getting escort together. So thank you, George, and we shall see you in a week's time. <laughs>